World Disability Day and with me in studio is uh, Dr. Prabha Joski uh, who comes from the uh, Dr. Joski Albinism Foundation whose motto by the way I was just having to look uh, I was having a look at it and it talks about help, uh, help ever, heart never, a nice one, I should mention that. And Alfredo Wuko, who is also um, the executive director of the Action Network for the Disabled, and we also have uh, Grace Nzomo, a student at uh, USIU here in Nairobi. She's uh, living with albinism, but she says, um, like their motto says, help ever, heart never. It's now my time to join them in studio. And uh, Dr. Chosky, happy to see you. Grace, thank you for getting time to be with us. And uh, Fred, it's a pleasure. always a pleasure. And uh, we mark the World Disability Day today, but it's also not lost on us that uh, we live in this country. And uh, just a comment from you, Dr. Choski, about the security situation in the country. Does it, before we just delve into the matters uh, uh, to do with disability, um, what will be your take about the security situation in the country? I think the security situation is really getting, uh, getting worse, mm -hmm. and uh, more so because uh, people have, uh, I think, lost, uh, uh, lost a lot of bit of uh, compassion in their heart that neighborliness and so many things. You see, like the other day we were reading about the person who killed his wife and killed children. Mm -hmm. He went to the neighbor to say that, uh, can somebody keep my children for me? And the neighbor probably must have refused. That's how, the, that's how it must have happened. I think uh, when we come out of our, uh, our comfort zone of the homes and reach out to uh, people who are, who are maybe in your neighborhood, people with disadvantages, people with, I think it goes a long way in finally feeling uh, uh, security. And security is not just uh, the physical security. Physical uh, security also, emotional security, emotional security. mental security. There mm -hmm. are so many things. You see a child in a, in a family is secure because he knows his parents are providing from them. Mm -hmm. uh, people should also be secure in the society, like people with albinism are really not uh, secure in the society. From our neighboring countries, we hear stories about albino children being killed, their body Especially parts in being Tanzania. sold. In Tanzania, their mm -hmm. body parts being sold. Then many people think of albinism, I think it's the ignorance also. So uh, ignorance of the condition, so people think that having an albino child is like a curse to the family. We'll talk, about, see, we'll yeah. talk about albinism mm -hmm. in a short while. Gras, does the security situation in the country leave you worried as a person? Yes, somewhat, because we expect, um, we live in Africa country and expect our government to really provide security for us, for us to be comfortable. And with the growing trends and with the news each day, we get more worried and more, yeah. And uh, we pray that uh, the government is going to do something. Fred, your take on security yeah, situation? I, I don't think if it's only me worried, all of us should be worried because uh, day by day um, something is happening and we are getting, people are dying and, and losing life. It is, life is a sacred thing that all of us should protect, however, even if you're in leadership or not. So I think we should work together as Kenyans and, and, and really um, improve our security. Uh, but also uh, the re people who hold responsibilities within government should also be, be playing their part. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, the, away from security now, and let's now focus on the topic of the day, World Disability Day. And Dr. Choski, the question will be, um, even as we celebrate this day, as a country, do you have anything to celebrate in the first place? I think people just uh, give a lot of importance to the negative aspect of uh, some of the conditions, but uh, I look at only at the positive aspect of that. Last mm. six years that I'm working, we have actually created role models for the country. Wow. People have, and I think with the albinism, it's a, let me first tell you what albinism is and what it is doing to our, uh, uh, what it really is, uh, how we can understand the condition. So it's a genetic condition, just like many other genetic conditions you have, uh, down syndrome, you can have uh, neurofibromatosis or you can have any of the genetic conditions. So a, a child is uh, born with defect of a pigment called melanin. So mm -hmm. this melanin is absent in the skin, it's absent in the hair, but the most important is absent in the eyes. Mm -hmm. And I'm an eye specialist, I'm an ophthalmologist uh, for last 37 years. So mm, this is a condition where it's genetic. But what happens is when a child, a white child is born to black parents, they are initially first really shocked People hear stories about, you know, that uh, this, uh, this is a curse to the family. It will bring uh, only misfortune to the family. 
their skin of course their skin is very sensitive to the sun mm -hmm. it can when they exposed to the sun it can give it can become red it can become blister uh, blister formation but uh, when uh, uh, they prolong exposure to the sunlight can actually give skin cancers which are fatal in these conditions and all that so parents get worried there'll be a lot of cost of sunscreens that will be uh, that will be needed and all that and the thing is the ignorance about the condition because people don't actually look at the eyes they are just looking at the skin and they think that it's a white child born to born to black parents and the brunt of the whole situation is taken by the woman the mother of the child the mother of the child most of these women are thrown away from the matrimonial homes because they have born a white child because they think that's not uh, it was fathered it by a white person and so almost by the time I came into this program about six to seven uh, years ago, almost more than 50% of our albino children were single parent children living with, uh, with grandparents. And the story is really very, very sad because this is not about, uh, it is not about, uh, I think more about ignorance, more about poverty, more about uh, um, uh, the society not accepting a, a, the, the a situation, child, the, the situation as it is. Mm -hmm. uh, even I think somewhere or the other, the medical profession also has uh, has really failed because when a child with albinism is born, the diagnosis is so important. Explaining to the mother, explaining to, to the, the father, father, then even now what we have done is, you know, whenever we come across a small child with albinism, we have people like Grace, we have... Uh, 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 we have near me. We have a lot of uh, people. They are there. So parents can actually see that my child can also grow beautifully like this. Can and also, uh, that is what. Exactly. And, and thus, um, Dr. Choski raises a fundamental question to talk about uh, children born uh, with albinism being viewed as a curse, those kind of challenges. Did you encounter this kind of challenges uh, no. for the time you've been going through? No, actually, I'm very lucky my parents stay together and they brought me up as a normal child. I actually didn't feel that I was different in any way when I was at home. But now in school, when I'm walking around, that's why I hear I'm Zungu or you're being treated a bit differently. But at home, my parents really raised me up well as a normal child and I didn't feel any difference at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So much that today you're a student at the university? Yes, I also manage Dr. Chok's Albinism Foundation. You're the programs officer? Yes. At the university, what are you studying for? I'm studying psychology. Psychology. Yes. And uh, that should be USIU? Yes. Mm -hmm. Fred, I know that uh, uh, Dr. Toski deals with matters albinism, but I want to believe your network works with something different, is it not? But matters to do with disability. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm an organization known as Action Network for the Disabled, um, and our work is primarily around young people with disability. So these are cross disability organizations working nationally, and more particularly on issues of employment for persons with disability. Um, you and I know that uh, in this country, um, if you see a person with disability coming to your office, the first thing you do is you close your door. Mm. Um, and, and, and no one expects us to go to their offices um, looking for work. The only thing you think about when we come to office, you're always imagining that we're coming to beg. While um, tons of young people have graduated and are looking for work, but nobody is willing to welcome to their offices. So we concern ourselves around how do we build um, uh, the know-how of employers to be able to appreciate and embrace persons with disability at the workspace so that they have an opportunity to work and, and, and um, get, a, get an income in exchange of uh, their competencies. And uh, talking about employment, uh, because I want to look at it from the, the, the albinism aspect and even when you talk about uh, people with disability, how is the situation, how is the employment market for the people with disability so far? I think the thing that really shocked me when I started working with albinism was that, uh, you know, these people with albinism don't have pigment in the eyes, so when they go out in the sun, they probably squint their eyes. Mm -hmm. People had never taken them <coughs> to a correct eye specialist before, uh, before uh, deciding what should be. 70 to 80 percent of the children in seven, six, seven years ago were attending blind schools. Many of them, actually Grace is a typical example. Grace did her primary school in print in Thika Road Christian uh, School. But when she went to secondary school, they said, you know, you, you are a person with albinism. You don't see. Can you do, believe it that this uh, child had to do her secondary education in Braille? And braille, children with albinism can actually see. Now tell me, who decides if the child has to go to blind school or not? Is, uh, is it the parents? Is it the, 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 uh, the, the, is the, the teachers? Idiots. Is it the society? Or it's an eye specialist? Out of the 600 people I've seen so far, 590 <coughs> have, uh, have, uh, are seeing me as an eye specialist for the first time whom I'm actually doing a detailed test to see how, how it was. Now coming back to your question, if a child has studied in blind school, Already the opportunities have been lost 
they have not been able to study science subjects, they have not been able to do uh, so many things. Mm -hmm. A child who is seeing, I came across many children who did primary in Braille, secondary in Braille, and they go to a university with pens and prints. So all along, when they were doing Braille, they were not actually feeling the words, they were actually reading the words. So that is what, these are actually children with lost opportunities. One of my patients actually called them as forgotten species. People never really worried of how much they are seeing. And as far as I see it, an ophthalmologist or an eye specialist plays a major role in their lives. Because see, skin you can still take care of. I have many people who are 40, 45 years who have never applied sunscreen, but taken care that they never went out in the sun. Their skins are still good. Hair is fine in African hair, I'm really happy they can mm -hmm. braid black, so mm -hmm. it really doesn't. So the main problem still is the eyes and we actually, that is what I want to do. And what we give them glasses are like photochromatic glasses. These glasses change uh, with, the, with the light, so they become dark when they go out. Now these people are able to keep their eyes open, they are able to. And uh, we, I'm also seeing that, uh, yeah, it was brought to my notice uh, maybe in 2000, 10 end or 11, that many of these children who are single parent children and uh, children of uh, living with grandparents, many of them were being chased away from school because of lack of school fees. And then I just thought, why not I start, I started paying school fees. And we also, now uh, I'll just give you an example. There was a child whose fees was paid in Kitui. He, he was uh, uh, staying in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. Now, suppose, and you know, a lot of donor funds also come for maybe awareness raising now. Suppose I'm telling that his parents had, uh, uh, had uh, attended the awareness raising uh, program. A uh, lot of uh, people are now concentrating on the sunscreen. Suppose even he had five bottles of sunscreen. How does this help this child who only needs 600 shillings to go to from Nairobi to <laughs> I think when we look at uh, donations, I think it's good to look out of the box. For me, it's not that it's not necessary. I could have actually done, uh, seen the eyes, maybe given free glasses, and uh, maybe uh, more there. But you see, this is what now. If the child has got even maybe he has got glasses, he has got uh, this. But well, if he doesn't have food, if he doesn't have transport to go to school, to how can challenge. yeah? That is what. So when we we uh, we help, we help in different ways. In different ways, yeah. Fred. Now that you work with an organization that deals with matters employment, can you paint for us a picture of uh, the, the, the employment opportunities available and are we seeing them? I know that uh, Honorable Isaac Maura is nominated member of parliament today. That should be an encouragement. Uh, we also have uh, cases, uh, Honorable Timothy Wanyonyi lives with disability, he will be on this set. I, I, and I believe that should be an encouragement. But down here, we seem not to see the presence, the, the people living with disability uh, being embraced in terms of employment, is it not? Um, you might be right, but as well, the situation is kind, uh, currently changing, but um, the only problem that is a slow pace because, you know, changing mindset is, is something that takes a process and takes um, concerted um, efforts, and, 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 and that in, in, in involves also media to try to highlight the positive sides of personal disability and the capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, when the constitution says that 5% um, um, uh, of, of jobs uh, both public and private should be reserved for personal disability. Are we really looking out for this information and highlighting the companies that are actually already uh, working on this and, and seeing what are they doing differently that other companies can adopt? Or even government ministries, if government, if it's government policy to reserve um, uh, jobs for personal disability, are these ministries following up? So if those questions are not asked, then it means people will be just doing um, uh, small things here and there but at, at least when, when, when the constituents say we are going to have representative for personal disability, we actually expect them to be asking these questions in um, legislative assembly so that policy makers are aware that someone is watching and now everyone feels that they are included and we, we can now see both private and public institution um, warming up to employ personal disability because one, it's a requirement, but secondly, actually, these individuals have their competencies, they've gone to school, they have skills they want mm -hmm. to offer. It's mm -hmm. only that we have viewed them for a long time as people who are incapable, mm -hmm. people who only need charity, people who need to be helped. While if I've gone to school, I have my degree, I have my master's, I have my PhD, but nobody is willing to see, to look beyond my CV. People are only interested in looking at my crutches. That is the problem. So from where I see it, I see progress being made, but actually we need to do more. We need to be highlighting some of these positive stories. We need to be holding these companies accountable because there's no way a market can have only one or two types of consumers. 
There's a variety of consumers. So is this country. We are a very diverse country. You cannot have an institution that only employs one or two people. We need to take care of all the diversity of Kenyans. And personal disabilities are part and parcel of this country. So employing them is actually not a favor. It's, it's not a, a right it's that it's people need to be included and they need to be employed as a matter of right. And when you talk about, uh, about that provision of the Constitution, we'll be talking about it shortly. But uh, Grace, uh, you've gone through the system. Mm -hmm. You now are a student at uh, the uh, USI University. Yes. And uh, the question will be, uh, considering you're uh, the programs officer at uh, Dr. Chosky Foundation, what are you doing maybe to encourage people who may be in a similar situation like you are and uh, who also want to reach where you are? using the, the, the position that you hold and considering you are a student at the, 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 the university? Um, basically, you encourage them through talking to them and just giving them your own life story because when someone listens to your story and knows what you've went through, they have hope. They mean things to just give them hope because the parents come with young, young children, they wonder how are they going to grow up, how am I going to take care of them, but they, when they see someone older like me, and now they have hope that they are going, their children are going to grow up and just be normal and pursue anything that they want to pursue. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so, Dr. Chosky, the question will also be uh, that uh, uh, Fred uh, cites a provision of the Constitution that talks about, listen, that when you're employing those private and public positions, remember people living with disability. What are you doing as an organization <coughs> to ensure that these people are also factored in and uh, that that provision is abided by? I think we still have a very long way to go because first and foremost we actually have to inform the society about what albinism is so awareness is really still very important. The second thing that we really have to do is um, my aim is that every child who reaches maybe six to seven years, I don't want to give glasses to very young ones but six to seven years when they, they are able to uh, take care of the glasses because some of my own observation is some of them are very short sighted. Maybe minus uh, the myopic by minus 12, minus 14, which even a person who was uh, who had pigment would have been considered blind. Many of the people label these people as legally blind. Surely, has anybody seen that after glasses are they legally blind? Because mm -hmm. the definition of the word legally blind is after correction, they should not be able to see 660. That is what a normal person sees at 60 meters. This person is see, seeing as what that's after correction. My own observation is out of these people that I've seen, none of them are really come in the bracket of legally blind. So first and foremost, let's get it out from the mindset of the society that these people are blind. That they have to, you see, whatever, whether you like it or not, putting somebody in Thika school for the blind, Likoni school for the blind, Kitui school, it's putting a stamp on them. Stamp that they are, they are blind. But who decided that they should be there in the first place? So I think once the society accepts them, once they see these people performing so well, the children we sponsor go to regular schools. And I'm not talking about, you know, integrated okay. schools or not. They go to total regular schools. And they're actually doing well. And I think the internet also has really helped a lot because children with albinism need a little bigger print. They need a... Uh, uh, they need uh, something close up reading and all these things. So it is, it is important that uh, the, all children now can study normal. So I think my, uh, our work is more to create awareness, to create role models. I think what we have really done is to create role models. And those role models, <coughs> by the way, just looking at uh, one of the booklets you gave me, I can see the role models here, Torch Bearers of Dr. Chesky Albinism Foundation, and you can see the children uh, here living with disability, I can see there are Josephine Wangeshi, Anne Wanjiru, talk about Gracia, I can see there are Brenda Wekes, I can see Jen Waitara Wairimu, Len, uh, Leonida Nyoso, Fevan Jerry, talk about Lillian Wafula, all these are people, and, and uh, the, the list continues by the way, and these are role models for the country. But then Fred, um, when you talk about that particular provision of the constitution, it's one thing having it. And uh, Dr. Chosky talks about we have a long way to go in terms of ensuring that we work the talk and implement some of those provisions. Uh, do you think that we are doing enough to um, implement it? And what are you doing as an organization as it were? Yeah, th that's a good question. Um, one thing we must appreciate um, um, when something positive is happening, and mm -hmm. for real, they, they are. Um, a number of companies that are actually taking up uh, these issues seriously. They're actually even coming up with policies within their uh, principles so that to ensure that going forward, they are aware of uh, the challenges faced by persons with disability. Mm -hmm. And when they're recruiting, they have this in mind. So when somebody comes, they're looking at their competencies as opposed to the disability that they can see, the physical disability they can see. Um, are we doing enough? Um, 
I think we should up our game both. Um, and, and for me, I think uh, our members of parliament should ask more uh, harder question about um, whether all the government uh, institutions, for example, to start with, are complying with the law because this, this law um, that is brought about uh, by, by uh, government and all of us are sent to this uh, particular constitution. So at least we have it written that 5% jobs should be reserved for personal disability. But then someone needs to go back and check, is it really um, working? Um, how are we doing in terms of percentage, for example, as of now? Because this involves data data for, for it to be taken authentic, it needs to be also um, looked at by government institutions so that we can corroborate and see that actually these are the numbers. What we are doing as an organization is that um, from our uh, small resources, we are preparing persons with disability for interviews. Uh, how do they make their CVs? How do they go for a, an, um, an interview and present their competences as opposed to their disabilities? Mm -hmm. And we are also supporting others to go for um, so kind of supported internships at uh, uh, different organizations, and, and some of them are even government ministries. And then uh, there are those that we are training in entrepreneurship so that. Uh, People are not only looking at the white collar job, they are those that can actually start business on their own. And then we give them, um, say, a small startup capital for mm -hmm. them to begin those business and see them grow so that they can now go to either microfinance or a bank to get um, a loan to upscale those businesses. But what is interesting is that majority of the employers actually, mo some of them do not want to discriminate. Mm -hmm. They do not know if a person with a can work. Until you prove that this, this person can work, and that one can only happen when they're given an opportunity to get into the office first. If they're not into the space, nobody can know about that. So the internship provides an opportunity for all those who are doubting, and, and we we'll call them doubting Thomases, to see that actually this person has competence even more than the staff who are currently employed here. When that happens, it means they are actually hired. And the, when they're hired, they change the whole narrative of the workspace because they begin to relate with other colleagues at the workspace, they form friendship, and that changes the mindset of work colleagues, who then when they go to their homes, they are also trying to talk to others, who might also be managers in other companies, and that narrative begins to continue, mm -hmm. uh, change, and, and then we see some positive results coming up. And you know what? I'm enjoying this particular interview, and uh, painfully I have to end this, because it is, it's amazing, you know, you, you, you're encouraging me. And uh, unfortunately, we have to bring this to an end. And, uh, and just in a sentence, Dr. Uh, Dr. Chosky, even as bring this to an end, in one simple sentence, just a word, even as we mark this day to Kenyans. I think the media plays a great role in uh, whatever I have to say, because all this time we have only seen negative stories about alpinism. <laughs> it's time we brought out the positive stories. It's time we brought out all the people who are performing beyond their capacity to reach out. And our motto is help ever, hurt never. It is also not only to uh, people with albinism, but it is to orphan children, to underprivileged children, to disabled people. Those all are mentioned in the thing. So we are actually right uh, uh, going that way. And definitely disability is not inability. For people with albinism, I think they can do anything. We have, Kenya has created role models in Mumbi Gugi and Isaac Maura. I think all, all uh, my albino children are capable of, uh, of doing anything. anything in the world, anything in the world. Grace, you are closing demands? Um, <clears throat> I'll reiterate Martin Luther's speech that his dream is when people will be judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. Yes. Now, in light of this day, judge people according to their ability, not really what you see outside, but what can come from inside and show. Yeah. Powerful one. Fred, Thank you. Last one. This year's theme for um, International Dis Disability Day is uh, sustainable development, the promise of technologies. Mm -hmm. That already shows us that there, there is an exploited market for personal disability to get jobs. How are we uh, breaking down the barriers for personal disability to be employed? How are we using technologies to ensure that someone can work from the comfort of their house, someone can have assistive devices that enables them to be able to function and deliver and in exchange get an income as a country? Can we be part of those that are dismantling the barriers that, it, that make personal disability look disabled. Thank you, Frederick Kawuko, the executive director of uh, the Action Network for Disabled uh, uh, People, that is. Grace, marvelous uh, words you. there, and uh, Dr. Chosky, I like your motto, by the way. It talks about help ever, heart never. 
And those were powerful statements that we just made on this set, and we hope that whatever you are saying is going to be implemented. And uh, I have to appreciate my sign language interpreter, Susan. You're amazing. Thank you very much for that uh, beautiful job, and uh, we just pray that you'll continue doing that superfluous job, and uh, can see you're also interpreting what I'm saying. That's awesome. And uh, even as we mark this day, the message out there is uh, disability is not inability. And uh, Grace says, judge her not by her color or the color of the skin, but by her character. Those are the words by Martin Luther King. I have got a dream. And my dream now is to usher in Samuel Njaroge, who will be talking about matter of security, even as I pave the way for that gentleman. I can see him there doing some, you know, jogging. See you after the short break. <laughs>